Podcast episode number twenty-eight. Bainte Ocho. Bainte Ocho, indeed. Yes. We are back in Venice Beach yet again after a couple of days of traveling. Yeah. Up north to see my sister for her birthday. Yep. Happy and birthday, Kate. Florence and the machine. Yes, in, in San Berkeley, Francisco. We, or, oh yeah, Berkeley, I guess, yeah. right? Yes. For those of you who have not seen Florence in the Machine or never heard of her, she's amazing. Yeah, it really is a pretty spectacular show. She's um, incredible. She's magical. She's just, um, her stage presence is really profound. And we, well, I've, you know, been watching her for a few years, but really fell in love with her at Coachella this year. And to go to her show, which is not amidst a festival, but it's just literally her fans all gathered to celebrate her is pretty special. She's yeah. Quite. Yeah, it was cool. So at Coachella, yeah. that whole situation is a trip, right? Because you're you're smashed in with a bunch of other people who are like trying to get good seats or good standing area for whoever's coming up next on the stage. Oftentimes, right? yes. Yeah. So yeah. we're yeah, we were outnumbered by Drake fans. Yeah. So it was <laughs> like it was forty to one. It was like people yeah, were watching Florence because Drake was going to be on next, but we were there for Florence. So it was kind of yeah. an interesting. Yeah. Dichotomy of energies. Yeah. Those Drake fans are just, they're just not true Florence fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, what it comes down to. That's, yeah. that's the takeaway. But no, it's, it's cool because you do get to experience a lot of different types of music there and you kind of can decide who you want to go see then in their full show. And yeah, we in were, real life. Yeah, in real life. And we were definitely looking forward to seeing her. So. Yeah. If you haven't heard of her, check her out, Florence in the Machine. And uh, if she's coming to an area near you, I would highly recommend you go see her. Totally worth doing. And get right up in front. Yes. Somewhere that it sounds good. And learn all the songs. Learn all the songs. On her new album along. because everybody's <laughs> going to be singing. And don't wear shoes. <laughs> yeah. Or you mean, yeah. Um, what else did we do? We went and saw, so my sister still lives in Northern California. My mom came down from Oregon, so we... It had a quasi surprise birthday party for her, right? Which was cool. And Adam's mom is really interesting. She went to Tennessee and actually did a fermentation school, like boot camp. Yes, fermentation, like fermentation boot, boot, camp. boot camp. Exactly. <laughs> so she has been trying to coach me on my kombucha making skills, which I literally tried to make kombucha all summer this year, and I just could never. I mean, I would get it. I would. You know, I would drink it and it was like, all right, technically, I guess this is kombucha, but I never really got it to like that uber fizzy bubbly state that yeah. you get when you buy one from the store. Yeah. And, and what was her, her the, she was said the final analysis? She said might, it needs to be sealed again and, and like double and, fermented. Yeah, yeah, double fermented. Yeah. So um, I didn't quite get to the double fermentation process. So I'm going to have to try it again. I really, if folks out there have tips for me on like if they do double ferment because i know like 99 percent of our audience <laughs> makes their own kombucha because <laughs> we're full hippie in this group um if you have any tips on making kombucha and getting it to that really bubbly state i would love to hear because i like the fizz yeah i really my, do my 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 fix would be to make it incredibly strong and then dilute it with bubbly water well, and that's the other option is I could just put soda water in it, but yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I like want the kombucha. I yeah. want it to be, I want to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. You want to succeed with your experiment. Yes. I get that. Yes. So anyway, anyone out there that has the bubbliest kombucha in the group, <laughs> hit me up and give me your tips. Your secrets. Yes. I need the secrets. Share all of your secrets on the internet. Yes. So anyhow, we are about to wrap up October, which flew by. Yeah. It didn't fly by quite as quick as September. September was like a freaky fast. It was like the fast. month that didn't happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like, wait, that were we even here? But October um, just buzzed on by. And you know, I'm sure a lot of folks out there are starting to really feel the season change yeah. and starting to get some of those cooler days. Yeah, and rain, right? So Texas is floating away. 
Yes. I believe. <laughs> Texas is floating away. Although we do have folks that are down under and they're just starting to go into their spring season. Yeah, so everyone's kind of, you know. Doing their thing. Doing their thing. Yeah. yeah. Starting to adjust to the seasonal changes. Yeah, for sure. And I hope everybody's um, feeling the workouts like that. That is sort of the the modality that we're going to stick with. I think, um, especially with these these sort of we're, as we're trying to ask people to go a little bit heavier and sort of increase um, the intensity, not not like AMRAP intensity, but just the intensity of the muscle involvement. Um, I think it becomes really important for people to be comfortable with the movements, right? So there's nothing worse than learning a new movement and then being expected to do it heavily, right? Better off to have something you're super familiar with, you know how to load it and you can really focus on trying to recruit some muscle and make some stuff happen. So, yeah. And you know, this all comes around because when you do start doing more technical things, you want to have this muscular base, you want to have this strength base that can carry you through the, you know, the movements that are more complex or more challenging or even, you know, if you're participating in sports or you're doing activities that require you to have that strength base, you're going to be so much more powerful in whatever else you do. Yeah. Everything gets easier when you're strong. Yeah. Like there, it just does. Absolutely. You know? yep. I was so. just taking a aerial silks class the other day and, um, I don't know if folks follow me on Instagram or whatever, but you know, I like to go upside down in the silks and you know, one of the things for a lot of women, I've been able to, to excel pretty quickly through the movements because I can actually lift myself up. I can actually do the movement strength wise where most women spend the first six months to a year just getting strong enough to kind of hold themselves up. Yeah. So, you know, it's just one of those things where no matter what you translate this into next, you're going to be so much better served because you can actually just jump in, learn the movements, participate in things. You don't feel like you have to start from square, you know, square one. Right. Which yes. is, which is cool. Yes. Which That's is the, super. being, being better at life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the whole idea. Yeah, we're definitely. Gonna, we're going to really make people better at life. So we uh, had a couple of people in the feed and it seems like topics sort of come up in succession. So one of the things that we had a few questions about this week and a few comments and sort of inquiries on was ketosis and, you know, using it for performance, but also using it for weight loss. And we kind of just wanted to dive back into ketosis. And I know a lot of subject matter we talk about repeatedly repeatedly <laughs> but that's just yeah, sort of how it na- works it's you know the, yeah it, it's the nature of the beast and you know each time we talk about it you may have new experience to put into the you know into the mix so the first time we talked about it you may not have had it may not have applied to you in the same way but right. the next time we talk about it you may have this maybe you've been with us six months now and you can say oh yeah now i get what they're saying you know you have this breadth of experience to apply to whatever the information is now. Yeah, so for sure. And when, one of the things that we find, especially when it comes to the, the ketosis component, I mean, there's a lot of knowledge um, out there just kind of in the, the general paleo primal sphere, right? Where you're like, this is, these are the kind of things we should eat. These are the kind of things we should avoid. And here's the generally accepted answers for why that is. When it comes to ketosis, what we find is that there's a small percentage of people who are incredibly well educated on the current well maybe not the most current research but certainly the books this is the this is the methodology for doing this you know this right. is what eating academy says about this and here's the studies that back it up you know here's what ben greenfield says about this and here's the studies right so it's a it's a relatively small fraction of people who have that level of knowledge and the rest kind of have heard of it right, right. so you get this a lot where you have someone that's like well hey should i do blah 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 you're like, well, boy, that's that's a pretty complicated question. I mean, it seems like it's simple, but it, it almost never is if you really want to get into the the nuts and bolts of it. And you know, Vanessa and I were just talking about this. I don't know the other night we were driving, and the the one of the problems that we run into with this stuff is that the the mainstream and common wisdom or whatever does not account for and cannot account for the nuance that's required to really fine tune this stuff. This Absolutely. is why you see these broad stroke, you know, requirements for, well, everyone should eat blah, blah, blah. And everyone should eat blah, blah, blah. And there's never really any, any dense information in there. And the, the problem is that it requires a lot of knowledge and research and practice and understanding to really know 
what those little nuances are that's either going to make it work for you or not work for you. Right. So as these things become more mainstream, you just have to be more vigilant as the individual user to, to really dig in and try to understand whether or not um, – what the the study or the book or the blog post or whatever is that are they talking to you right you know because they might not be they might be talking to performance athletes who are trying to figure out the you know to squeeze the last little bit of you know glycogen out of their left thigh you know and <laughs> right. in that case yes this is the perfect thing in order to do that but right. for you know, Joe Blow, average person just trying to, to get by in their life, it may not even be relevant. Like you, you may go through a tremendous amount of time and effort tweaking and changing your entire life around to get that 10th of a percent of performance, but you, you need like 40% more performance to be competitive. So that 10th of a percent doesn't really matter. Right. Right. And so, what you should be yeah. focusing on is just getting more sleep and reducing your stress. Right. So it's, <laughs> so it's always like, you know, I, what, what I, stage I, yeah. of the game are where, you at? Where too? are you at? And what, what's the, what is the goal? You know, and I fall victim to this all the time because I'm a researcher, you know, I mean, I really like to research stuff. I'm like, Oh my God, this is, how did I miss this nuance in this thing? And then you read and you dig down into the study and you start looking at the, you know, the, how effective was this? You know, what was the P value in the study? And you're like, Oh, okay. So yes, across the board, this was a 0.03% increase. And you're like, that's probably not worth it. You right. know, I'm not going to retool my entire life for this 0.3% increase in, in some number that may or may not be relevant or important to me in reality. Right. Right. So I guess, and it's tricky because, you know, we are like Adam said, and this is part of what we were talking about is we are, we're hit with these, you know, broad theories where, which is, you know, low carb is going to fix everything or the one with the least amount of insulin in their system wins or, you know, you get all of these sort of taglines that come along with the paleo wellness world that you just, you know, you may not know exactly what that tagline was meant for. It may be, it may be meant for someone very specific who, you know, was on a ketogenic diet for cancer treatment or for, uh, totally for, um, Alzheimer's or, um, Cardiovascular one. disease, Cardiovascular or diabetes, disease. or diabetes, or seizures is the one I'm oh, trying seizures. to think. Of. <laughs> like, or, no, or I'm looking at you, else. and you keep telling me all the other, all things, the other but things, seizures, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. know, it's always about understanding where you are at, what's most important in your journey, and this is, again, you know. N- we always say like, this is why a lot of times the personal consults are necessary. Like if you want us to tell you very specifically what you should do, there's not really any way for us to broadcast that out to a group, you know, without knowing, especially when you want to do really specific things like, should I train long distance in ketosis or should I, you know, try to be ketogenic, be the first ketogenic CrossFit games athlete. Exactly. Yeah. It's (laughs) it's kind of like, uh, mm, I don't know. So, You know, it's just once again, we're just going to go through what we do know about ketosis, where it can be helpful, you know, some of the concerns and just kind of go over it again and see if anything resonates with you. And, you know, we just keep moving forward, keep learning, keep trying to broadcast more information. And hopefully that helps you decide which path to choose. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to focus a little bit more on performance for this one, right? As opposed to, um, you know. Right. Right cell metabolism and stuff yes. right, with regard to, to ketosis. But so just in very broad strokes, the, the performance benefit that we get from ketosis is generally that, um, being actually in ketosis and just to, to a lesser degree, but depending on the person, again, some, some pretty significant individuality there. If you're just really metabolically flexible, Right, you can still see this a lot of this benefit. You don't necessarily have to be in ketosis. Right. And this is one of these things that we I think we kind of talked about this a little bit with the low fat, very low fat uh, Denise Minger thing. Is what do you mean by that? When right. you say you're in ketosis, are you actually in ketosis or are you just eating super low carb and How are you're you assuming right? right? How do you know you're in ketosis? So if you've been out and your your goal is to improve your your VO two max via ketosis how do you know what are you doing in order to make that that kind of stuff work right so or are you just super low carb training you know where where do you fit in that spectrum because 
it's going to matter when it if, it, if it works, then it's just magic and cool. It doesn't really matter. But if it doesn't work, then you're going to need to know, or you don't see that significant benefit. You need to know where you fall in there so that you can actually make some decisions about whether or not, or what to tweak, right? Right, exactly. So, so meaning, did I actually reach ketosis and did I actually do right. the thing I was trying to attempt to do and therefore I have a measurable outcome? Right. Or did I just or, go right. super low carb for a week and assume that that probably did it? Right. But come to find out my lack of sleep and stress levels were, you know, jacking up glucocorticoids, which were kicking me out of ketosis. Right. So for right. all intents and purposes should have been there, but these other things in my life were keeping me out of that range. Right. right. So to any case, that was sort of a, a necessary bird walk, yes. right? Like that. Cause we do need to know, like you need to know specifically what it is that you're talking about. Are we really talking about being in ketosis or are we being super low carb and, and metabolically flexible? Right. Right any case, the, the, the benefit, the thing that you're looking for there, um, that it just, for whatever reason, it works out that we, um, we're, we're much more aerobically efficient in ketosis. And when we have ketone bodies available to burn, right? So meaning that you, it requires less oxygen to do a given amount of work, which is, which is pretty cool. And that's right. why there's such significant implications for the endurance athletes here, right? Because that is the limiting, the, the rate limiting factor for people is their ability to continue to produce ATP while breathing oxygen, right? While using oxygen to do it. Once you get to the point that you are running out of oxygen, right? Like you're working so hard that you can't keep up respiratory wise, then you really start to transition into glycogen energy systems, which means you run out of gas, right? You've, right. you've tapped into a finite fuel tank. Literally, you are going to run out of sugar at some You're point. You're going to run out. Yeah. yeah. You can only store so much and you can only replace it so quickly. So right. being really efficient uh, in that regard is is huge. And that's where we really start to see this stuff. So you see um, the an increase in aerobic capacity. You can go way harder, way longer without getting into... Uh, without elevating your heart rate to the point that you can no longer maintain aerobic capacity, right? And you switch into the sugar burning mode. So that's the, that's the goal, right? So that's the, that, that's the performance benefit that people are looking for. Now, where that has been sort of reverse extrapolated, if that's a word, interpolated <laughs> backwards is that if you, you know, so, so one of the things that's unhealthy about endurance training is all of the carbohydrate that you're eating, right? So that is, that's, I'm not going to say that that's a myth. I don't think myth is the appropriate word for that, but that is a thought process, right? There are people who say, well, I quit training endurance athlete or I quit running endurance because it was oxidizing myself. And I felt like I was having to eat a ton of carbohydrate all the time. And why just burn all this sugar all the time, right? right. The sugar burner chronic cardio concept. I'm not disputing that that's, you know, uh, a that, thing. that's a thing. It's <laughs> yes. a real thing. And it is, there's no doubt in my mind that reducing training hours and, and, you know, getting glucose under control and all that kind of stuff are really good things. But we've, we tend to find this, this role in here where you're, where you're maybe approaching it from that perspective where, okay, well, I'm going to do this because this is the healthiest way to, to go about being a person. And what, I would sort of throw out there is that ketogenic being, being a ketogenic endurance athlete is probably healthier than being a glucose burning endurance athlete. But if health is what you're shooting for, being an endurance athlete may not be the bee's knees, right? right? What you really may want to do is find something that, you know, um, increases your vitality and keeps you moving and keeps all of this stuff going, but doesn't put you into the chronic cardio world. Doesn't force you to choose some extreme of, of, um, you know, diet and exercise. Yeah. Forth, I mean, right? this is, well, we see this with endurance. We see this with, with any kind of athletics, really. There's the path where performance and health deviate. And right. this is the path when you start to look for ways that you can run longer on a more sustainable fuel source. That's what you're doing. Right. 
let's be clear. That's the goal. And that's the first goal. The first goal is not health. It's not sustainability. It's not wellness. It's not any of those things. You can try to complement your primary goal as well as possible, which is like what Adam's talking about here. This is probably the best way to do it if you want to do it. But, you know, just know that that's not that's not the path to, to your highest wellness necessarily. necessarily right? And especially, right. so again, let's, so let's, let's try to bring this back into some very specific context. So let's say that you are a recreational 10 K. The 10 K right. doesn't even count. I don't think like you can, you can run 10 K on maybe half marathon or blood, something. Blood, blood, yeah. On yeah. The fasting blood sugar alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I probably couldn't. <laughs> Some people can. Some, somebody else somebody can. can. <laughs> Anybody who's, who's anticipating running any sort of distance can probably just do it. You're right. <laughs> but so if you're that person and you're you're planning to do this run, but your general um, goal is your overall health, right? Then I think what you're looking at with this is that doing some sort of low volume, relatively low carbohydrate training is is probably just fine but you have to make sure that the rest of your life supports that and that's where it starts to get a little bit tricky yeah absolutely because now you've got uh everything you know all your job stress your sleep stress your kid stress your you know whatever in the heck is going on is adding to your allostatic load is that amount of work that your body has to do in order to recover and there's no doubt that going out and pushing the limit on your aerobic capacity in a low carb, very, very low carb state does not support that kind of stress level. Right. You know, it doesn't, it it just doesn't do it in the same way that, um, you know, throwing down a sweet potato here and there would. And it's interesting, you know, um, having coached, um, over the years, one of the places I've seen this a lot is in the corporate world, because a lot of people that are sort of, you know, in the white collar corporate America, they're very goal and results driven. And so I've seen over the years, many folks who want to do stuff like this are typically those who think I want to get in shape. I want to lose some body fat. I'm going to run a marathon or I'm going to run a half a marathon. And then they make that their, their goal. And they think it's in conjunction with their health and fat loss goals. But really they're typically the people who are the most stressed, the most underslept. Totally. And then they try to make their ultimate goal to lose weight and get healthier, a half marathon or a marathon. And it's, it's, I've seen it time and time again. And it's always interesting to try to talk to people and say, okay, wait, which one is actually your goal? (laughs) Do you want to get healthier and lose fat or do you want to run this marathon? And it's a tricky one because we're so indoctrinated into this endurance world being a way to be fit and healthy and, you know, lean and all of these things that the, people have a really hard time digesting that those are divergent paths. Right. Right. Well, and especially because that divergence is at a different place for a lot of people. Yes. You know, it's like if I was to go ride a bicycle, like say I was started, took up road biking, which is not going to happen. But if I did, (laughs) you know, so let's say I did it. I think I have uh, the body type that I would probably be really lean. You know, like if I rode biked all the time and that was just kind of how I ate and and kept it in that 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate, but just rate limited the amount of actual glycogen burning I was doing, I think I would be super lean. I'd be skinny and, and lean. You'd be all limbs. Right. Yeah. I'd be all all limbs, but, (laughs) but pretty lean. And so some people, and I am perfectly healthy, Yes. you know, at that sort of level of leanness. Now there's others that that's not going to be the case. They're not going to be super lean and they're going to chase that farther than they need to go to the point where they're, they're chasing a performance goal of leanness, right? you know, and and they're thinking that they're doing something that's healthy, but now you've gone this route where it's, you've, you, you took the right turn, (laughs) you know, and maybe you should have kept going left totally up to you, but just know that you took a turn, you know, and, and you need to sort that kind of stuff out. So it's where it gets so dang hard for people to, to understand that. Well, Well, look at so-and-so. They do this and they look great. Exactly. And like, right. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's a really easy thing to do because you see someone that you like the way they look and you just say, okay, well, what are you doing? I'm going to do that. I'm just going to do what you're doing. But you don't understand that most people have their own 
you know, genetic predisposition, their own hormone, hormonal profile. There's, there's all these things going on. There are lifestyle factors that maybe the exact same plan on you won't yield the same results. So, yeah. you know, and I think the bottom line is more is not always more. So if you are trying to actually get f- fitter, meaning stronger and leaner, which is kind of what I deem fitter in this world, um, then you, Sorry about that. It's off. Oh, maybe it's mine. <laughs> it's yours. I was like, wait, it's turned off. <laughs> so if you're trying to get fitter or leaner, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes it's just literally about time, like consistency over time. Yeah, and and not blowing yourself up, right? Where you right. get where you get burned out and all kinds of stuff, you right? Know? So, yeah. So there's, I mean, I guess really what it comes down to uh, is that there's there's healthy ways to do. And we're going to keep tying this back into the sort of endur- endurance performance. There's healthy ways to do it, super low carb, and there's healthy ways to do it um, in the more traditional kind of high carb way healthy with, you know, air quotes around it, right. As healthy as you can and healthier ways. Right. So you can, you know, if you're the high carb person, you can do this with soda and candy bars and pizza, or you can do it with fresh fruits and vegetables and some starchy tubers and some stuff like that. Right. Right. So very, very different outcomes, you know, I mean, for, for most people. And then the same on the low fat side of it, or I'm sorry, the low carbohydrate side, you can do it you know, with, with bacon and, and lard and a bunch of stress and, you know, impending like adrenal fatigue, or you can manage your life in a way that, that you, you know, uh, thrive in that. Right. So it can be done both ways, obviously can be done. Um, it just, you just have to recognize that it's going to take a lot of tinkering in order to, to get it right. And you need to have some kind of some kind of metric, you know, use keto strips, use, use something that you can sort of check yourself with along the way to make sure that you're actually achieving the the goal that you want to be achieving. And maybe not just chasing yourself down a rabbit hole of a bunch of sugar cravings. Right. So the bottom line for me is that there's really clearly healthy and unhealthy ways to train on both ends of the spectrum here. So if you're deciding or if you're trying to decide which route to take, then you need to have an idea of, of why it is that you would be choosing that route or the other, right? Um, each of them has its benefits and each of them has its limitations. And so you kind of need to, um, the way that I would approach it anyway, is to find sort of what, it, what are the benefits that you're looking for and then see if um, you actually training that way are going to see those benefits, right? So... The first example that comes to mind for for me here is like this borderline type two diabetic, super sugar burner, who wants to do wants to start this marathon running and or whatever endurance sport, and the their big plan is to do it all with carbohydrate based stuff, right? So this is a person who's severely insulin resistant. Adding a whole bunch of carbohydrate into the mix is probably not the best idea, right? And then can they do it? Yeah, people do it all the time. You see people, the 100-mile cyclists that stop and eat a huge bowl of pasta at the end, right? Um, the, it can be done, but is that the best approach for you? Probably not, you know, if you're going to be taking it to that extreme, right? So the other side of the spectrum is that, you know, this super low-carb, paleo primal person who also wants to go run this marathon or whatever, and they want to do it in ketosis, but... They're not handling all of the other lifestyle factors. They don't sleep. They've got six kids running around. They have a full-time job. They have all of this kind of stuff going on. And so spending that much time under stress of training in ketosis plus all of that lifestyle stuff is probably not the greatest idea. You know, I mean, those aren't the sort of conditions that I would recommend interjecting a ketogenic diet into. Right. And, and I would just like to say, you know, it doesn't even have to be that you have six kids and it's like super maxed out crazy. It's like, you know, it, it could just be that you're only getting four or five hours of sleep every night. You know, it could, it could just be one factor. So, you know, when you're considering this, 
you know, you may hear a description like that and say, okay, oh, well, no, I'm good. I get at least six hours a night and I only have three kids, so I should be fine. You know, always take into consideration that like, if you are under the bottom line is if you're under a lot of stress, a lot of fatigue, that going ketogenic may be, you know, antithetical. You know, one of the the things are actually there's two main concerns for me when folks are too low carb or ketogenic, and that's if they start to exhibit signs of, you know, hyperthyroidism or adrenal fatigue. Anytime you have issues in this area where you know, you're starting to see disruption in your energy levels, your menstrual cycle, your mood. Uh, you can even see it when it comes to your performance. You start feeling really exhausted during your workouts or recovery is taking way longer than normal. These are probably signs that, you know, trying to either stay super low carb or make being super low carb or ketogenic a primary goal is not necessarily in alignment with your health at that point. So, you know, and I've talked about this before, I think men tend to be a little bit more robust and, you know, I, not that I just talked about it and that makes it so, but I think that the studies and what we sort of understand is that men can sort of tolerate a little bit more stress. Um, they can maybe be a little bit lower carb, but for women, it starts to be a little bit trickier. And so if you're one of these women that are already, you know, on the verge of maybe having some hormone issues or your cycle is irregular or, you know, or you think about working out and you just feel exhausted just from the, you know, the mere idea of working out there, these are probably some signs that, you're not in a state of being that you should probably tinker in that direction, you know? And once again, like I was saying with, you know, folks that I've dealt with a lot of times in corporate America, when you have this mentality of you want to go harder, you want to go faster because you want to see the results, you, you know, you want to, you really want to put your best effort forward so you can start to see these really tremendous results, which a lot of times are fat loss or performance goals. But if you don't have a really solid base, then you just have to, <clears throat> but if you don't have a really solid base, you just have to be careful. So the thing that I typically recommend for most women, if you perhaps don't think that, you know, that your lifestyle supports going super low carb or super ketogenic, but you want to see some of the benefit of that low carb you know, push, then what I recommend is trying to stay really low carb throughout the day and doing a little refeed at night. And, you know, preferably you do that post-workout so that you're, you're working more intelligently with your body and you're getting all the really great health benefits of that stable blood sugar and low insulin throughout the day, but you're giving yourself the necessary fuel for recovery and, you know, for conversion of the T4 hormone to T3, which requires insulin. And, you know, you're also minimizing the dysregulation of, of cortisol, which can lead to adrenaline issues. There's a lot of things that you can do by making sure that you are giving yourself that little boost of carbohydrate or, or refeeding on a somewhat regular basis. So, you know, yeah. for those of you, yeah. And I just, I just want to add to this, not just low carb but you could replace carbohydrate with calorie yes, on this as well. Absolutely. Right. So we have to be super careful with people, especially women going super low calorie as well. And yes. we just, I mean, not that it's not, um, I mean, I don't recommend that men do it either, but I just feel like women have a tendency to do it. You, you yes. don't find usually a lot of guys that are in the 700 calorie camp, right? you know, just, for whatever reason that that's well, we're, just you know, women just grow up with the mentality of diet restriction. Like that's yeah, the, totally. the solution. Yeah. 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 It's tricky, you know, and, and I think for so many women, you know, especially when you're coming into this, maybe you've had kids or you've gained weight or life's gotten crazy and everything's a little out of whack. It's hard for you to know, well, am I in a good, safe place to be experimenting with going lower carb or am I in, you know, a, a state of health that could support this kind of tinkering because, you know, everything may just be a little wonky. So, you know, before you dive too deep into, you know, going really low carbohydrate or calorie for sure, yeah. maybe tinker with the timing of your right. carbs first. Well, and, and then 
manage some of these other factors. I mean, this is one of the things that we really are trying to capture with our company, with Be the Wellness and, and the Unveil Your Wellness program, is that the diet component of this is it's wildly important, but it's completely thrown off base by lifestyle factors. Totally. Right? So if you know, if this stuff's not working and if you aren't getting where you need to be doing whatever it is, well, let's start taking a look at the other low hanging fruit. How much sleep are you getting? How's your mindfulness practice coming? You know, how does that, how's your overall stress level fit? And just, you know, understand that you may, the, the, the right thing for you may be a ketogenic diet, but not yet, not until right. you get all these other factors in order, you Absolutely. know, and that's the, and you kind of have to start checking. I mean, you, we like to talk about everything all at once because we do think that they're all important things. But I think you've kind of got to start clicking off some of these um, more fundamental boxes, right? You need to make sure that your metabolism is functioning properly. And for some people, a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet might be part of making that happen. But then you need to make sure that it stays that way, right? And and keep checking off those boxes to ensure that you know you're setting yourself up for success. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, I've been really proud of seeing how many people in the feed, you know, write, didn't do the workout today. I didn't get enough sleep last night, need a little extra recovery. I mean, it's like, honestly, when Adam and I see that, we're like, yes, they get it. It's so cool. And yes, we assign points and you get to check the boxes. And at the end of the month, you know, whoever did the most stuff, quote unquote, wins. But really, whoever's actually seen the most benefit from this program is the real winner. And so those of you that are taking time to really honor the cycle that you're in and the place that you're in, it's so awesome and really yeah. telling that this information is resonating with you. Yes. 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 Um, super <laughs> the super last, awesome resonation. Yes. The last thing I want to <laughs> mention too, and this is this is getting a little bit away from the ketogenic side of things, but you know, being too low carb has an effect on the flora and the gut. And we've heard a lot about this probably in the last year, I would say, a year to, you know, year and a half. People yeah. have started to talk about the way that our gut biome is being affected by people being too low carb. And, you know, we're not necessarily talking about folks who are still eating some potato or sweet potato or rice here and there and like have yeah. some pretty good starches that they integrate. Right. Well, well, and then even some, some of the denser, like fibrous veggies yes. right, can be, are, are huge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We're talking about folks who are sort of leaning towards that ketogenic space where they're right. trying to keep, you know, even their carbohydrates as least dense as possible. And so if you do that for long enough, you start eliminating some of the prebiotics essentially that help your gut bi biome be more diverse. So, you know, and it all just, it's so funny because it all spirals around and it's not mm -hmm. like any one thing is the, the one thing. It's, right. it's the mindfulness, it's the gut biome, it's the stress, it's all of the things coming together yeah. to create a perfect situation for your health to flourish. Oh my God. Is it ever Everything in moderation. <laughs> oh no. no! Damn it! They Turns were out. right all along. <laughs> no, everything in moderation, including moderation. Yes. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Well, the the problem with the word moderation is it's a lot like ketosis. Like, well, wait, how what do you do define you moderation? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah, only it's a ate term. one box of figgy jammies. <laughs> right. Actually, yeah. I have to say, I'm pretty happy with how. Uh, popular the figgy jammies have become even yes if, even if it's just the lore you know i mean it, it has become the go-to food we should have bought stock in figgies oh, and jammies, figgies and jammies. <laughs> no but you know i wanted to to make mention of that because it's you know sort of feeds into the ketogenic mindset and practice that you know staying ketogenic or super low carb for a long period of time can also have an effect on your gut biome biome so totally so what's the solution? Ultimately, it's always just, you know, tinker and test and retest, but try to really decide where you are, where are you actually at in your process? Because if you are like Adam said, you know, the, the type two diabetic who has, you know, six kids and a super high stressful job, and then you're like, I'm going to go run a marathon and be ketogenic. Okay, well, maybe we should set some different parameters and goals for your first expression towards health. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And 
You know, it's always weird because we go through these all of these things and we talk about these extremes and how you shouldn't do this and you should probably avoid this if you're this person and this person. And there's a lot of people that probably fall right in the middle. They're like, actually, I'm probably, I don't know, I'm pretty good. I sleep seven and a half hours at average. You know, I don't remember. My life's like a five or a six on the stress level. Yes. And I don't know, I eat a pretty balanced, flexible diet. So should I do a ketogenic, you know, marathon? And you're like, sure. If you want <laughs> you know, to. If you want to, yeah. go, go for it. You know, right. check this stuff out and, and, and see how it works for you. You know, it, it really does become a matter of, of sorting it out. I mean, we've seen time and time again that people can do it. They can be healthy in these, you know, sort of extreme ends of things. Um, and you can also burn yourself to the ground, you know, so it yeah. really just depends on uh, how, how, um, how hard you attack it and how, how smart you are with uh, partitioning your fuel and your training and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Which all those things apply for the carb burner, the sugar burner athletes too. Like yes. that's the, that's the, you know, the other side of this is that we, we put all of this sort of emphasis on, well, be real careful with the low carb stuff. And the reason that we do that though, is because we do see a lot of adrenal issues. Exactly. Right. And so, thyroid issues for women. Yeah. yeah. Which, right. Yeah. So yeah, the whole HPA axis starts to get sideways. <laughs> don't don't, don't mind that. that. Just, <laughs> just, just gunshots Venice in Beach, the gunshot. neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Venice Beach is, you know, still has remnants yeah, of its, yeah. of the ghetto. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, yeah, oh it's coming goodness. around, but every now and then every, yeah, there's a gunshot. Every now and then but, there's <laughs> a helicopter and some guns. Well, speaking of, yeah, well, you we should probably wrap this up before the helicopter shows up because that'll be loud. Yeah, exactly. So but, anyhow, but no, I think it's a really important point that Adam made. And, you know, for those of you, this is how we've come into this whole thing is by tinkering on ourselves. So, I mean, both Adam and I have tinkered with ketosis and, you know, have, have tried it and done periods of time where we're tinkering with it and, you know, deciding where in the spectrum of our health it fits. So yeah, it's, it's all still, good. Yeah. You know, we're not trying to discourage people or dissuade you from doing that. Just trying to make sure that no one digs a deeper hole if right. they're already in a place where maybe stressing their body more, is not going to be the best thing for their health. Totally. Yeah. That, that really is the, that really is the takeaway. Yes. So with that said, and, and as the gunshots continue, continue. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and wrap it up and uh, close our windows and lock our doors. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for another great month. Uh, as always, you're the bomb. We love you guys. You're amazing. What a cool community we are cultivating and thanks so much all those things all those thanks, things guys we'll see you soon bye